Fifty years ago, Norman Mailer became an overnight success with the publication of his first novel, The Naked and the Dead. Since then, he's written 30 books, several screenplays, and hundreds of essays, received two Pulitzers and a National Book Award, and also run for the mayor of New York City. The Time of Our Time is a retrospective of his work selected to tell the story of the past five decades and how he wrote about those decades. I am pleased to have back at this table, Norman Mailer. Welcome. Oh, thank you for you. that uh, rich introduction. That was, you know, if you, if you don't have passion for Mailer, you're not going to have passion for anybody, right? But, uh, for or against. For or against. Tell me what the time of our time is about for those. I know what it is, but for the benefit of the audience, uh, how did you put all of this in there? Who selected what goes in here? And, and what, why would I want to pick this up? Well, there's a fine fellow named uh, Michael Lennon, who's the provost at Wilkes University. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> he knows more about my work than I do. So he kept feeding me pieces when I told him that I was going to be doing the work and please send me stuff. And so before we were done, we had about 5,000 pages to look at, of which he probably had sent me 4,000 of the five. I know my work, but he knows it even better. And then I, we started going through it, and I started going through it on my own and trying to figure out how to do the book. And originally it was going to be uh, all categories, writing about sex, writing about war, writing about boxing, each in its own separate place, uh, set pieces about places. Uh, poetry, uh, uh, plays, all of it. And I thought, this isn't going to work at all. It's going to be, um, people are going to look at it and say, oh God, one more anthology. I really don't like anthologies. Uh, and they'll dip into it and that'll be the end of it. And then I thought of doing it chronologically in the order in which I wrote this stuff. But the trouble is that uh, I've, had a very, I've had a jagged career as a writer in that I'll write one thing and then I write the opposite of it. For instance, I wrote The Naked and the Dead. Then I wrote the second novel, totally utterly unlike the Naked and the Dead was Barbary Shore. And so I thought, that won't work either. And then I thought, why not? I've been writing about America up and down and back and forth for years. America's really been what I've been most interested in. And so it, I suddenly realized I could take something that I wrote in 1951 and put it in 1951. And I could take something that I wrote in 1990 in Harlot's Ghost about the CIA right. and put that, that was also about 1951, and put it next to it. And so I did that all through the book. And I kept having a model of, of what I think is the great American novel, which was John Passus's USA that came out um, in the late 30s. Wonderful novel and, you know, one of the books that made me want to become a writer. And he used to have characters, he had a, had a situation where the same characters would reappear in different situations over the years. And it seemed to me that I had people like Gene McCarthy and Muhammad Ali who kept reappearing in my different pieces. Yeah. And so... The book reads almost like a novel, because uh, for me there's very little difference between fiction and nonfiction. In other words, I, I can't bear nonfiction unless it reads like fiction, by which I mean that there's a sense of presence, you create an atmosphere, uh, you, the people are as real in, in their character as they are in novels. And you tell a story. And the story, well, the story is given to you, which right. is, the, is the great uh, advantage Benefit of nonfiction. Of nonfiction, right. But you, and, and, okay. Um, there's so much in here, I don't know where to start, but let me just start with the notion of John Dos Passos. What was it about USA that made you want to be a writer? Was it just what? Well, he gave this extraordinary sense of, of, of America with all its variety. You know, I, th I think we live in the most ex exceptional country ever for a writer because there's so many aspects of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, I think, I don't know about other writers, but I know I've had an odd love affair with America as if I were married to this incredible woman who I half loved and half hated. And all through my work, you know, I'm always, I'm always thinking about, oh, God, there she's gone and done it again, you see. <laughs> but, oh, how can she be so disappointing, just yeah, getting right. excited about her? And, you know, there are many disappointments in, to living in America because I always think it's going to get better and it doesn't. It gets worse. The architecture in America, for example, has gotten worse every year for the last can 40 years. Can you think years. of anything that's gotten better? Yeah, the MTV has gotten better and better. <laughs> <laughs> you watch MTV? From time to time. Yeah. I think it's the only new art form that excites me because it's, it's so talented. Yeah. And, and I love the montage of it. And, you know, Madonna really was, was a great artist in MTV. She How did. they use the images and the cuts and all of that and, and the combination well, so, of sound and, and, yeah, the, and video. Yeah, the, the downside of it is, is that they've had an immense influence on advertising and the damn advertising has gotten better than ever. Yeah. I mean, the advertising now is marvelous. It so never, it makes us all conspicuous consumers. Yeah, well, you know, they never advertise the product anymore. They never say, buy this because it's good. Yeah. And here are the reasons it's good. What they'll do is you'll see some guy uh, <coughs> climbing a, a rock face. And then you'll have a lovely water washing through. 
and then it'll say uh, mutual insurance forever. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's right. Why is it that sports figures attract you? Well, because they're the opposite of writers, and yet they have the same, uh, I think they have the same kind of inner life in one way, which is they're always focused completely on what they're doing when they're in a sport. That's one example of it. The other is the um, writing is so sedentary that, yeah. that you t tend to be excited by people who do the opposite of what you're and doing. And it's also winning and losing. Yes, and it also the fact that there's a decision there, which you never have in writing. You, you know, in writing, uh, you want to know whether you wrote a good book or not. Wait 40 years. Warren Beatty is here on Friday on this program. Mm -hmm. You have seen his movie, which yep. is about two subjects you like, movies and politics. Mm -hmm. What would you think? Uh, after I was talking to my youngest son, John, who's 19, 20 now, and um, I said to him, listen, I saw a great movie. He's, and I said, I'll tell you something else. Mom thinks it's a great movie, too. <laughs> he said, what is it? I said, it's Bullworth. Yeah. And he said, Dad, if you think it's a great movie, and Mom thinks it's a great movie, <laughs> then it has to be a great movie. Because <laughs> you never agree on anything? <laughs> not on movies. Not on movies. And, uh, Why do you like it? Well, tell, tell the audience at first <coughs> what it's about. I'll have you tell them what it's about. Now, Bullworth is, um, my God, look at this in my voice tonight. Bullworth, overcome again with emotion. <laughs> uh, Bullworth, Bullworth is about a corrupt senator, corrupt Democratic senator, who uh, is so disgusted with himself that he's uh, planning his own suicide. He's going, he wants to be shot by a, uh, a hired gun. So the insurance money will go to his yes. heirs. And uh, what happens is that uh, <laughs> before he gets shot, he starts speaking out. He figures he's got three days left to live, so he'll start talking. And he starts telling everyone off and telling everything off. And then, of course, he begins to love life now, now, yeah. the, now that the buried man, the buried <laughs> radical has come out. And uh, so he proceeds to... But the hit's still on him because he, uh, they haven't gotten the word. Exactly. And so um, the, and the picture just evolves through that and through all that. But the characterizations are extraordinary. The acting is wonderful. And it's the funniest movie I've seen in 10 years. Why is it funny for you? Because it just cuts through all the, the lard and the smog and, and the deadness of, of, of American politics today. It gets, cuts through the hypocrisy. It gets through the, through the, the very insanity of, of meaninglessness in American politics now. And, and it's done it. You know, and I, was, I really was warmed up by that movie because I've known Beatty for years. And I've always felt he's very talented. And ever here, he'd written the script, half the script. He directed it. He acted. It's his best acting performance ever. Yeah. And, and I felt he never had done the maximum. And then he did. He's done it with this movie. This is his maximum movie. And I thought, my God. This is his it, it, It's always that feeling when you have a friend who's an artist who does something that's five steps above what they've done before. It's, it always it, it exhilarates you because you say, yes, if he did it, I can do it too. I can write a bigger book now than I ever wrote before. So I felt personally excited by that film. Do you think, I mean, this may not be your expertise, it'll do well at the box office? Oh, do you that's think the, it'll find an audience? That's a great gamble. I, have no, I don't have a clue. It might do fabulous, fabulously well, or it might get skewered by a lot of critics. A lot of people are going to hate it because it, it's very anti, um, uh, anti the system. Anti-establishment, anti yeah. the system, anti the way things work, anti conventional norms of behavior. Hmm. And in a funny way, it, it's one of the most radical movies that's ever been made. But it's all done within, it, the thing is it's most artful, and it's done within a vein. Yeah. And as you see it, I, I just couldn't stop laughing. The politician becomes a rap artist. You know, or not artist, but a rapper. In well, I think people got that wrong because, uh, you know, a couple of black people, notably uh, Skip Gates, were c and, complaining and that the rap was very bad. Well, of course it would be bad. If a white man starts talking <laughs> rap, he's not going to talk authentic <laughs> rap. No, exactly. It's going to be his notion of rap. Yeah, exactly. And, and I, think I don't the think it was supposed to be good either. No. The, the, the humor was that, uh, that here's this rap, which is, which is a very pale reflection of, of black rap, yeah. African rap, but it was just so, but it's so funny that he's doing it. He's the stuffy Californian who's suddenly trying to throw off the shackles. What and would happen in American politics if somebody would do that? Would basically somebody that would have some credibility, let's say who'd been elected something, would say, for all the reasons, wouldn't go into the weekend that this guy did, but would say, I'm going to go out and tell you exactly what I think. I may not have, but, you know, a couple of years to live. I don't know, but I at least am going to be true to myself, mm -hmm. and what I've been living is a lie about the way things are and the way things ought to be. Well, I think it's almost impossible. In other words, look, this is a work of art. It's a right. farce. It's a farce at the highest level. Right. I mean, it takes the notion of farce and raises it to the point where you can say a farce is as important as a tragedy. 
It's extraordinary as a farce, absolutely extraordinary. But you don't have to believe it's true. What you can believe is the, uh, the inner truth of it. In other words, this is what people would like to do. I, I think we get so bound in habit that it's almost impossible for us to throw off the shackles overnight. Mm. You, you, you know, in other words, this is movie logic. In movies, things sh can and only can, but should happen much more quickly than in life. Because if you, if, if, if you took your time, if, if every time you wait for a cab, you had to wait for the cab to arrive in a movie, the movie wouldn't work. Exactly. So in that sense, movies are compressions. They're, they're ideal situations, ideal whether they're good or awful. The, the situation is always compressed, always quick, and always to the point. So in that sense, this notion of a truly corrupt politician finally redeeming himself or looking to redeem himself uh, is not believable with the people we know. But in art, it's believable. In, in movies, it's believable. In, it, it's believable in the sense that if you use it as a premise and see what you can do with it, then it's like a marvelous exercise on the piano with the variations. You, you see, what's wonderful about this picture is, is the high intelligence that you feel going all through it. You've got a wonderful high intelligence. The sense and, of insight about the way things are. Yeah, you know, I kept saying, how does Warren know that much? Yeah. My God, he's good. You, you know, yeah. uh, and I've known the guy for years. And, and, and I had, always had a lot of respect for him. But this time I thought, you know, he's become a major artist of the highest level. Yeah, yeah. I, I liked it. The, the interesting thing about it is that he made, this is a guy that made Reds on the one hand. Yeah. And we all were waiting for him to write, to make a great movie about uh, Hughes, Howard Hughes. Mm -hmm. And along comes this, yeah. sort of sneaking up on us and probably sneaking up on everybody. It probably came out of Hughes, it, it, I would guess. But that's just my guess. He okay. may do Hughes yet. I Let me know. turn to the President of the United States. Uh, in your judgment, is he a tragic figure? Is he a heroic figure? Is he a, a figure to be um, treated with what? Well, this moment, I prefer to treat him with humor, because um, I, have, I have my ups and downs about Bill Clinton, mostly downs these days. Because? And, well, I've written about him right recently as saying that there was something not tragic about him, but that he's a genius manque, because he probably had more of a sense of politics than anyone's come along since Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, but he's done very little with it. You know, he took, the, he took the, the boat of the Democratic Party, which was in very bad shape when he got in, and he just dismantled it and decommissioned it and birthed it mm -hmm. next to the Hulk of the Republican Party. And there they sit moored together, two old hulks of parties doing nothing. You know, they're both very empty parties at this point. The Republican Party is torn by dissension between the right wing mm -hmm. and the libertarian wing. Yeah, that's right. And the Democratic Party is just bewildered because they've got a Democrat Republic, uh, president who's a Republican. So it's hard to take him too seriously. I think his suffering is going to come when he begins to realize that he could have been a great president and he never bit the bullet. He never asked anyone ever to do anything that would mean that he would have to be true to their allegiance because he was asking so much of them. Doris Kearns Goodwin once said, and I was very taken with it, that reason Clinton's so popular, he doesn't ask anything of us. If we were asking things of us, we wouldn't put up with the idea that he's probably a liar. And somebody once said that leadership is about asking people and persuading people to do something that they don't want to do or might be painful or uncomfortable. Exactly, exactly. And that he hasn't done. And he keeps giving these, what I call boutique politics. He's, he keeps giving these wonderful little prescriptions for this or for that. Do you think this guy survives this? You yeah, think I think he it? has. I think he has. Yeah. As long as the market goes up, he'll survive anything. You think is that connected to the market? He's not connected personally. No, no, uh, but I, I know what I mean. In other words, people's as long as people feel good about their lives because of economic success. I don't any, know if they feel good, you know. Assault. I don't know if I'm so sure they feel good. They feel half happy. They're half happy because they got more money, and that's yeah. nice. But anybody who's got any inner feeling gets a little nervous about making money they haven't quite earned, that they've earned through anxiety rather than through sweat. Yeah. You know, and, and that's how, you know, many, many years ago, back in the 50s, uh, I had a lawyer who was very good on the market. He said, let me invest a little money for you. And I started with about 20,000 bucks, and he very quickly, on one day, about three months later, he said, you just made $10,000 today. And I was both excited and dismayed because $10,000 is what you got for an advance on a novel in those days. <laughs> yes. And I thought, I'll never write again with this. You know, why write? You spend three years writing a book and <laughs> hoping for it, and uh, yeah. now you make it in a day. Just call my broker. But I kept in the market. I stayed in the market, of course. And then three months later, I lost 10000 in a day, yeah. the same 10000 And I thought, that's it. I'm now out, and I've never gone back. Because my feeling is, it's not. I don't want to start living my life on that market edge, where it's the first thing I do when I pick up the paper and I'm seeing how my stock is doing, and it changes my day a little. If I'm going to lose money that way, I'd rather bet on a professional football game and win or lose. Yeah, and, and suffer the joy of watching it slip away or else come to you. Yeah, but, it, but 
So what I'm getting is I think an awful lot of people are now living with a feeling that, uh, that uh, there's half happiness. They feel half good because they're getting more money, and they're feeling half uneasy. Because given that huge Judeo-Christian tradition in this country, right. they just feel that they don't quite deserve it. And um, so I think they forgive him because they feel like him, which is they're, very, they're in a very good position relative to where they have been, but it don't feel quite right because there's too much right. And so there, I think there's a great tolerance for him. You know, like he's no better than me and that's okay. That's the way I want it. I don't want a president up there who's going to breathe sulfur and brimstone down on me. And make me feel uncomfortable about yeah, who make me I feel, am. Make or, me feel unvirtuous. Make me feel less, less, less good than he is or yeah. less virtuous. Norman Mailer, the time of our time, just listen to this in terms of a body of work. The Neck and the Dead, Barbara Shore, The Deer Park, Advertisement for Myself, Death for the Ladies, The Presidential Papers, The American Dream, Cannibals and Christians, Why Are We in Vietnam, The Deer Park, The Armies of the Night, Miami, The Siege of Chicago, Of a Fire and on the Moon, The Prisoner of Sex, Maidstone, Essential Aaron, St. George and the Godfather, Maryland, The Faith of Graffiti, The Fight, Genius and Lust, The Executioner's Song of Women and Their Elegance, Pieces and Pontifications, Ancient Evenings, Tough Guys Don't Dance, Harlot's Ghost, Oswald's Tale, An American Mystery Portrait of Picasso as a Young Man, The Gospel According to the Sun. I thought uh, you'd never get through it. It's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? There's a body of work. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Great to see you. Okay. Norman Mailer, the time of our time. Back in a moment. Stay with us.